Hello and welcome everybody to the Irish Agriculture Technology and Innovation Platform brokerage events. So this is the final of the events for today, focusing on FinFish. So for the past couple of years, BIM have been funding um, Intrigo to interview various researchers and industry individuals to identify promising technology and innovation that has potential for the Irish agriculture community. So as a culmination of that work, uh, today there's going to be a selection of these innovations and technologies presented to you. And um, so we're starting right now, we should be finished around 3.30. Um, just to let you know, you know a little bit about housekeeping, um, this presentation is being recorded. It will be available later on the ITIP website, which is www.iatip.ie. Um, you can pose questions during the event. And if you move your cursor over the Zoom, you can see that it says Q&A towards the bottom. You can click on there and submit questions. Each of the presentations will be about 10 minutes and there'll be five minutes for the Q&A at the end. If you have questions after the event, then please email them to secretariat at iatip.ie and we will pass them on to the speakers. Um, it's also possible to join the ITIP mailing list, um, which is available on the website. So now I'll pass you over to Jeff Robinson from BIM. Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone on such a cold day. Everyone knows that Friday afternoon speakers have a huge challenge. And that is why, without doubt, we have the best selection of speakers here for you this afternoon. Uh, we all know fish health is a critical is a critical issue, particularly for fin fish producers. There are five different topics we're going to cover here. They're they're vastly different, but they're all covering aspects of fish health. So that's kind of our I think our trend for today. So without further ado, I would like to hand you over to Anita Talbot from the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. And she is going to be speaking with us about the development of autogenous vaccines for finfish aquaculture in Ireland. Anita, you just need to press your mic on. Okay, can you hear? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, is everything okay? You can see my screen? Yep, everything's okay. good. Great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anita Talbot and I am a research fellow based in the Marine and Freshwater Research Centre uh, on the Galway campus of the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. The work I will be talking about today has been funded through BIM and uh, the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, the EMFF. So just to go on. So why would the development of autogenous vaccines be important for the Irish aquaculture industry? Um, vaccines are used in both agriculture and aquaculture as a way to prevent disease outbreaks before they happen. Preventing disease in fish, in addition to promoting good fish health and welfare, helps to reduce production costs uh, by not having to provide treatments to eliminate disease. Less bacterial disease ultimately leads to a reduction in the use of antibiotics, which not only is helpful in preventing bacterial drug resistance, it also supports the maintenance of the organic status of the industry. So autogenous or emergency vaccines, as they can also be called, can be used when a commercial vaccine is not available or licensed for use in a particular country or if there is a commercial vaccine available, but it is no longer effective. So the advantages of autogenous vaccines uh, are that they're quick to produce. You can have one on site in about two months compared to a commercial vaccine that could take about seven years to get to market. They're cost effective uh, as they are relatively inexpensive to produce. Autogenous vaccines can be can provide a customized solution to a local problem in that they are made specifically for the location where the disease outbreak occurred. So using an autogenous vaccine at this site will prevent the disease from reoccurring. These vaccines are very useful for the immediate treatment of new and emerging diseases where no commercial vaccines exist. 
They're also very useful for use in the production of new aquaculture species. One example of this would be in lumpfish production in Ireland, where there are currently no licensed vaccine, no licensed commercial vaccines. So um, uh, in this slide, I would just like to run through the production process of autogenous vaccines. It all starts uh, when sick fish are identified uh, on an aquaculture production site. This can be a freshwater or a marine site. Samples are collected uh, from the six fish for diagnosis and brought to the laboratory. Uh, at the GMIT, when we get the bacterial samples, we use a variety of methods uh, to identify the bacteria. These include extracting the DNA and sending it off to be sequenced. We then compare the sequence we get back to other known sequences in a database to see if we get a match. Other methods we use include growing the bacteria on different nutrients or, and chemicals to see if it produces a color change. Uh, the pattern of the colors produced can also be fed into a database to get an identification. And these methods are called the API and biolog assays. So uh, once we know what the bacteria is, we grow we culture or grow it up, but not before taking uh, some of it and putting it into long-term storage. I will talk more about this in the next slide. So to make the autogenous vaccine, uh, we do a large scale bacterial culture, which we then inactivate before we manufacture the vaccine. We do sterility testing uh, after the vaccine is made to confirm that there are no live bacteria in it. Uh, and after this, the vaccine is delivered to the site from where it was collected for use. So in, in addition to making autogenous vaccines, we are also testing the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine at GMIT. At the moment, we have a lumpfish trial running where we are testing an injectable vaccine for lumpfish uh, for protection against Aeromonas samicida, the bacteria that causes furunculosis. Uh, after we got lumpfish in, uh, we, gave, we gave them a week to get used to the new environment. Uh, and then we tagged them with visible implant elastomer tags. These, this is a fluorescent mixture that can be injected just below the dorsal fin. Uh, the tags become visible under ultraviolet light. The fish to be vaccinated got one color and the control fish got another. Uh, after four days, uh, we then vaccinated the fish by interperitoneal injection into the abdomen. The fish were held for almost six weeks and we start testing the effectiveness of the vaccine next week. We will generate, we will test the vaccine by exposing the fish to the Aramona salmonicida. We will generate a survival curve uh, with the results and we are hoping to see that the vaccinated fish have a better survival uh, than the non-vaccinated fish. So apart, in addition to making and testing vaccines, we have also established a fish pathogen collection or biobank at GMIT. At the moment, we have bacteria from salmon, trout, perch and lumpfish for a variety of diseases, uh, which we have stored on cryobeads and in glycerol at minus 80, in minus 80 freezers. And also we have freeze dried it for storage uh, in a fridge at four degrees. Uh, we have also uh, maintained a duplicate biobank in a different location in GMIT, just in case there's ever a power cut. Um, so what have we done so far? So if in this project, this project started in 2018 and it was to run for two years. So uh, in this project, we have made three rounds of an immersion vaccine for perch to protect against Aeromonas hydrophila, which can cause skin ulcers and septicemia. The last batch of the vaccine was used to vaccinate 250,000 perch uh, in February 2020. We have also made an oral vaccine to protect against Aeromonas hydrophila in perch. Uh, this was used to top coat 40 kilograms of fish food in September 2020. This was given as a booster vaccine to the same fish that got the Im immersion vaccine in February. Uh, we have also made a trivalent injectable vaccine to protect lumpfish against furunculosis, fibrosis and red spot disease. Uh, the vaccine was very well tolerated by the fish over the last six weeks. And as I said earlier, we will know how effective it is by the end of the month.
So what are our market barriers for this innovation? Uh, the goal of this project is to produce vaccines to meet the needs of the Irish aquaculture industry. If we are to continue uh, to, to think about ways to scale up production, this would involve using a GMP production facility. So we may need to form partnerships with other companies or organizations. If we look at the scope, then we need to know what pathogens should we use in the vaccines. Uh, would it be uh, bacterial or viral or both? Um, then what vaccine types do the industry need? Is it dip, oral, injectable? This will all depend on the size of the fish and the stage of production. And for, and for what fish species are these vaccines required? Uh, is it for the major species like salmon or minor species like the lumpfish and the perch or again, both groups? There is currently a, a feasibility study underway to try and answer some of these questions. So our, our next steps for, for this work, the first is to secure funding, which we are very optim optimistic about. Uh, the next then is to continue to grow the biobank collection. Uh, we will collect and culture uh, fish viruses. Um, we would like to develop a, a, a vaccine for trout to treat cold water disease. Uh, we were, we're also hoping to develop a monovalent vaccine for salmon to treat frunculosis. And we'd like to start developing viral vaccines. So just at this point, uh, I want to say, just say thank you to Felix Schultz and to Susie Mitchell in Fishback Group for all their help in, in helping us with this work. And uh, if anybody needs more information, all my details are there and I would welcome your comments and your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. <clears throat> You're definitely going to keep us on time today, that's for sure. <laughs> what was that, 10 minutes? Oh, that was, that was pretty quick. Yeah, that was very good. Sorry, I'm just going to check the Q&As because, oh, here you go. We, we'll ask this one from Keegan, who says, what kind of costs are expected for farmers in terms of autogenous vaccines? Is that something that you have information on now? Or is it uh, vaccine dependent? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, the costs are, are in, in, in the same from what they, the costs are, are, not, are in had not having to treat disease and in, in preventing the disease. I wouldn't know the figure offhand. It would depend on the type of fish that they're, that they are, that they're producing. It would depend on the amount of fish. It would depend on, um, you know, what, what, it, what, what, how their production will stop. If they, if they got a disease or what kind of mortality rates. Um, if, if you have an effective autogenous vaccine and your fish are healthy, you know, the fish grow better, you know, the production rates are, they'll reach their targets, you know, when they're supposed to. Uh, I couldn't, I don't really have a figure for that, but it's just, you know, healthy fish are better fish. That might not be the correct answer. <laughs> Is that okay? I don't, I don't have a, a, an actual figure a dollar a euro figure for that okay yeah i can appreciate that there are certainly a lot of variables i'll actually just take this opportunity to say i'm not sure if anyone's looking at the chat i did mean to say before we kicked off that anyone who is not on the panel obviously their microphone is turned off <clears throat> if they would like to ask a question if you just uh, hover over the zoom screen you'll see there's a q a at the bottom and if you click on that you can type in your question so we've actually, we've another question here from Lucy and she is wondering about the demand analysis work that you mentioned. Who's doing this and when will it be done? Okay, the, 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 we are looking into making new vaccines. We're getting this feedback from the industry and from the fish vets. Uh, they are out on the field and they see what's happening with, with the vaccines that are currently being used and with uh, what they think might work to improve the situation. Um, an example of this is, is the Flavobacterium that affects the trout in the hatchery. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very difficult bacteria to culture. Uh, there is no vaccine for it uh, available currently. 
So what we've been trying to do is to grow up this bacteria it, um, and maybe make a dip vaccine for the trout like we have been doing for the perch. But we're getting the, we're getting the, the demands, or not the demands, but we're, we're finding out about the needs directly from the hatcheries through the vets and, and they, we're in contact with them uh, constantly. So it's the industry are telling, are telling the vets what they need and the vets then are asking us, is it something we can do? And we're very open to trying everything. Uh, we've worked out all the different ways now to make the bacterial vaccines. Uh, and now, you know, there's other vaccines, there's other, there's other diseases coming along. There's, uh, there's, there's viruses now starting to affect the lumpfish, um, which there's no, there's no uh, vaccines available for that either. So we're, we're, get, we're getting uh, the information from the vets as the diseases are emerging. And, you know, we would we like to be able to provide a solution in a very quick manner, so that we can we can help the industry and we can, um, you know, have a, have an effective solution as quickly as it's needed. Uh, you know, vir vaccines are very quick to turn around, uh, autogenous vaccines. So uh, anything we can do to help the industry in this regard, um, we are open to doing so. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. There's a we we actually still have a few more minutes for you, Anita. So work away, yeah, work away. Or it seems like you there's a, an awful lot of questions. Uh, Coming your way, Keegan is asking, how long does it take to develop an autogenous vaccine? If we go back to your your slide with the with the little chart on it showing the the chi in there, any idea how long it would take? Keegan yeah, to develop well, an the, autogenous vac vaccine? the vaccines we have developed already, it's a simple enough process. If you're dealing with one bacteria, you you, you get your bacteria from the site, you identify it, you grow it up, uh, and you um, make large quantities of it you inactivate the, the pathogen, and then you do sterility testing and release it. Now, with a, with a simple, vac with a simple or a bacteria like Hydrophila that will grow very simply and very easily, you can have a vaccine released in about two months. Now, I, I'm, I, I do not re release the vaccines until the sterility testing has been done for at least a month. I need to make sure that every stage of the vaccine process has been tested that to make sure that there has been no contaminants in it, and that there's been no there's no live bacteria. Um, we were we're developing these vaccines in a research laboratory when we really should be doing it in the clean room. So you know we have to be overly careful in the fact that we our serology testing has to be done uh, to a very high standard, which which we which we do. Um, so for. If if you were if you were in a GMP facility, you could have you could easily have one produced in a month, because I I'm overly cautious with the sterility. I, I'm taking at least two months, but it, but still that's a very short time compared to what you would have if you were developing a commercial vaccine. Now I know with COVID they're releasing them within a year, but a standard practice for a veterinary vaccine is about seven years. So uh, it's, it's very quick. Now with other vaccines, depending on whether it's an injectable uh, and it has an adjuvant and it has multiple components to it, it could take a little bit longer. Some bacteria are um, a lot harder to grow than others. And, and then you could get a delay in that. Um, with one of our vaccines, which we made, we had a Vibrio angularum in it, which we had to import back in from Spain, which took us months. And then it took us months to, to try and get it to grow. Um, but, you know, it, it depends. The shortest would be a month. You could be up to maybe four or five months, depending on how hard it was for the back to grow. Uh, does that answer your question? I, well, listen, it was Philip. I'm sure it does. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was from Keegan. Yeah, there's actually one last question from Philip, which I don't want to grill you too much. We've still no, a minute okay. or two left. So we'll just fire this one off, which is, is it possible to use multiple vac vaccines and have them still be effective? multiple vaccines at the one time i'm assuming i'm uh, assuming that's the yeah that's the intent yeah, yeah. Well, but at, at the minute some of the vaccines that are out there have might have up to seven components in them and um i'm, I'm sure they're all effective to a certain degree but uh, what, what we're trying to do here now is to go back and um test or compare maybe what we'd like to do is maybe compare a, a vaccine just on its own for something like frunculosis, the ermonosaminosida, to a commercial vaccine, which would have have it as one component of maybe you know one in seven, 
and just to see is it the fact that you're you're putting multiple vaccines to, you know multiple components in a vaccine together uh is it diluting the effect that's a that's a question we'd like to answer um in the gmit it's, it's one of the questions that are that it's on, it's on the it's on our agenda um i i i I'm, I'm sure the companies have tested them and and before the commercial vaccines before they released them and have found them to be somewhat effective, but uh, it, 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 it remains to be seen over time whether that effectiveness is maintained. So I think that's one of the questions that we we are trying to answer here is, is to go back and compare a single vaccine again uh, to a, to a multiple and see is is there a difference? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Anita. Okay. We are now going to move on to our second speaker of the afternoon, who is Sven Joran Kolsto uh, from OptusGale. And he is going to present Bioscope, Biomass and Welfare Monitoring Software. Welcome, Sven. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us to uh, to speak here. I, I, I re realized two things preparing for this. I don't know how to pronounce uh, I a <laughs> yeah. and I've never been to to Ireland either. I've just been to so many St. Patrick's parties, so I feel I I know a lot of uh, Irish people. But it's very nice uh, being invited here. Thank you very much. Um, should I just go ahead and uh, share my presentation? Yes, do please. Thank you. All right. So let's see. So I'll be presenting OptoScale, which is the company I founded back in 2015. Um, so I've written here that we are in search of the optimal production. And uh, basically it's <clears throat> what we try to do is give fish farmers a bit more objective data that are relating to the operations that you are, are having every day. And because we believe that there is a huge benefit in knowing the exact growth, the exact weight distribution, exact number of fish having wounds, and so on and so on, so that you guys can make better decisions. So today I want to spend some time uh, telling you about what we do, and I'm also uh, sharing some information about trials we have going in Scotland. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> I hope you guys don't have the same um, relationship with the Scots as we do have with the Swedish because uh, we are Norwegian in OptoScale. Uh, so I hope you, you uh, think that's okay that I'm mentioning Scottish uh, trials in this uh, arena. Please give me a hint beforehand if it's not. Uh, <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> just briefly the bioscope, that's what we call the unit that we've uh, made. It's a stereoscopic camera that we've uh, created and sends out uh, a a light basically that's able to then image, measure and track the fish swimming past it. I'm sure many of you have seen similar devices. So our device is able to measure roughly 10 to 20,000 fish uh, in any given day. And what it's being used for mostly up till now is giving estimates for the harvest. Uh, so I'm, I don't know if any of, or all of you know how fish is sold, maybe all of you do, but typically our customers sell their fish a week ahead of uh, harvesting it, so they need to make an estimate. And uh, with the estimates they make today, our Norwegian customers say that typically they end up selling maybe 15 to 20% of the fish in the wrong kilogram bracket. So that's what we can help them with, because with our estimates, you can get much closer to the perfect estimate. You'll never get to the perfect one, but quite close. So we have several, where we are in the like vicinity of five six percent of the fish being in the uh, wrong bracket, so that's um, that's kind of that's one thing. And the the second thing is is measuring growth. You know, I think that's the real upside to this. Uh, you know, getting the most out of your feeding, making sure that you don't underfeed. That would be the worst, of course. But also, overfeeding isn't the, isn't a good situation. We can help fish farmers know how they're performing with regards to feed by telling them exactly how much is their fish growing. Uh, also for all the fish that we measure, we can give a welfare indicator. We can tell them, well, does the fish have wounds? Is it starting to show signs of maturation? And so on. Oops. So <clears throat> it's, uh, it's not America first. 
uh, or USA First or whatever he calls it. It's uh, Norway than the world. So we've spent a lot of time um, doing the development here in Norway. Uh, I have experience from, from a couple of startups in aquaculture. Uh, some have gone well, some have gone not so well, but uh, is there one thing I know? It's that when you're delivering to fish farmers, you need to deliver quality. It, you, you have to be sure that when you deliver something to the pen, it's gonna work. Uh, so that's something we've spent a lot of time on making sure that we deliver quality. And it's much simpler for us to do that in Norway than it is to, the, to do that in say Canada. But the past year, we've become so confident in the system that we've also shipped a significant amount of units to Canada and, and Scotland. So I then need to do this. <laughs> so this shows uh, a, a quite a spread now in terms of ge geography. And we are hoping to do much more uh, abroad in the years to come. I think there's a great potential for us. So when you get the system, it's not the system per se that you, you're paying for, it's the data. So we've spent a lot of time making a portal online that's uh, very easy to use and you get the data you need. So this is a typical measurement period. You would have here one dot per day, which is the average weight for that day. And of course, the trend line in this case is then the growth. So you can see both what's the weight of the fish today, what's the growth of the fish up till now, what's the width of the distribution, relative growth, and, um, and the K factor, which is basically how thick is the fish. And these are things all in themselves we can track from day to day as well. K factor, for instance, being something we believe is extremely insightful because you can compare different pens and there's a huge difference on a single location how the K factor is developing from, uh, from week to week. Also with regards to the welfare, um, this is also of course available in the same portal. So we then in identify, uh, I have to say the three ones on the top are our main focus. It's wounds, spots, well, scale loss and maturation. And those are the focus because those are things you can do something about. Many things that are uh, relating to health or welfare are not so easy to do anything with, but wounds, for instance, you definitely can, uh, plan how to, to, to not create any more wounds at least. So, um, yeah. A, a separate point from the technology that I find is very important to mention here is how we treat customers because of course we, we do believe we deliver the best technical project product, but our ambition is also to, to deliver the best customer um, experience. Because uh, if, if the customer isn't feeling he's getting uh, or understanding the product, some minor uh, nuisance in the product, how it works, if that's the case, then it's no good. So we have uh, dedicated personnel that's uh, all the time only working on uh, following up customers, talking to them in weekly or monthly meetings, and the daily contact with those who want that to make sure that everything is working exactly how it should and that there are no unanswered questions and that the results are as expected and so on. <clears throat> I can also mention for those that want to use uh, the data in some other place, that's something we're entirely fine with. We'll just then give you an access to the API and you can, you can uh, harvest your data from there. Um, in terms of team, we're currently now 13 people growing quite rapidly at the moment. Uh, we used to be a very tech focused team, but we're now of course building a, a assembly service customer facing organization as well. So it's now roughly half and half, uh, half on development, half on uh, sales and service and, uh, and uh, building this because we do actually build everything in house in our offices, which are in Norway, as I maybe did not mention. We're in Trondheim for those familiar with Norwegian geography. And uh, just like to, to show something we're proud of, because <laughs> that's always nice. Uh, we are very customer focused. Uh, we are working every single day to make sure that the customers who have chosen us are content with their choice. They're gonna be choosing us again and again for the next hundred years is our goal. So, so we, we need to make sure that uh, they are very happy. And we now have several testimonials from big customers saying that this is the best product in the market. We've reviewed 
many and because there definitely are competitors to us um, but we are now gaining a lot of traction such as this which is something that makes us very very proud <clears throat> um, once it gets to operation i'd like to just point out it's not very difficult getting this uh, done even with corona you know, typically we'd travel and set up everything the first time, but with Corona, we've been having to do this remotely and training people via Teams, uh, but it's working really well. It takes uh, a couple of hours of training and then the personnel at the site can get this into the water and up and running in very few amount of hours. It's basically everything comes ready. There's a box, a cabinet coming with a preloaded SIM card. You plug that to power, throw the instrument or, or place it uh, gently as we prefer into the water and it starts measuring, uh, uploading data automatically, and you just look at the data on your uh, on your PC. Um, yeah, and, and uh, we do have a rental model for this, which covers all the running costs, so there will never be any extra costs for you as a customer, so long as you don't ruin the device uh, in a very uh, abrupt manner. Um, so just uh, before wrapping up, I guess my time is probably uh, nearing the Mark, uh, we have now been uh, trialing this with Cook in Scotland using four units for harvest estimation. It's very interesting for us because the pens there are very, very different from the Norwegian ones. And I'm suspecting they might be similar to the ones used in Ireland, although I don't know. Um, so we were interested in seeing how will this work and the results speak for themselves. I think uh, we are getting very good results. And this is in a regime where it's quite difficult for us to get good measurements because there's a lot of changes being made to the harvest plants all the time, which is, I guess, also typical. And also we're getting feedback that they are very happy with customer service. Actually, we were in a meeting with them just before the weekend where they say uh, they are now holding other suppliers to the standards that we are providing them with, which is, I have to admit, I, I did have a tear in my eye when, when the guy said that. Um, so that's that's fantastic to hear and it's what we try to do but it's very nice to hear it as well so I think that's the end of my 10 minutes uh, I, I'm right here we want to do more business over the pond I guess that's really the US <laughs> like uh, strictly speaking but I don't have a better word for uh, for, for you guys but uh, we we would love to come to, to Ireland and do do business with you guys thank you very much Thank you very much, Sven. That was uh, that was very interesting, and I'm sure there's a few people very interested. So I'm gonna I have a few questions for myself, but if we have enough coming in through the Q and A, we'll we might not get to mine, and I'll just chat with you later on if the opportunity arises. Oh, here we go. We have a cheeky question coming up first that I'm not going to vet out. I'm just going to ask the question, and then you can decide how you how you dodge it. Can we know what kinds of prices have been involved in your trials in Scotland? Yeah, so uh, uh, the prices are extremely affordable. I can say it's uh, it's uh, so. So I I would prefer to do that as a part of a. Uh, uh, we have no problem sharing prices, you know. But um, uh, there is a lot to discuss. We have different modules. We have different service regimes. And if it's a trial, it's a different thing. So I would prefer to to um, to do that in uh, in following up, but. The general price level that we have for Norwegian customers is uh, roughly 2,000 uh, pounds. I don't know the exchange, uh, exchange rate at the moment, 2,000 pounds per month, but there are many things to take into consideration. And that, that's a lease. So we, we have only a leasing model. Okay, very interesting, yeah. Now I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna add my question onto one of these questions. So Damien is wondering, is it possible to get lice counts? And to that, I would like to add, if I could, what size range as a fish mm. are you currently monitoring? So if you have, you know, yeah. have you been doing everything from smolts, post-transfer smolts at 100 grams, right up to five kilos, or have you tested how effective they are at those various size ranges? Yes, I was supposed to say that. I'm remembering now. Uh, so we've we've been measuring at fish from 100 grams to um, 10 kilos. So uh, it's quite effective at all the ranges of fish. Um, uh, yes. And do you think just the the kind of first question? 
in terms of sea lice monitoring? Do you think oh, that yeah. your equipment can play a role there? Yes, we do have that under development. So we are planning to release that in 2021, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, we don't, we, we don't want to be more concrete before we know exactly. Um, yes. Hmm. <laughs> okay, and there's a there's some someone has has asked if there's a way to follow up with you. I'm not sure whether you could share your screen there and put up your contact details, or whether you're happy for us to pass on your contact details to people who are interested who might contact Intrigo. Sure. So, um, what do you think is best? I can uh, I can do that on my screen right now. Um... Let's uh, see, I'll, I'll try to answer the other question while doing that. So in terms of biofouling, um, we, we recommend washing every two weeks, uh, but it's, it's basic cleaning. Uh, it's not, not anything uh, big. Um, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to multitask. That's not something I'm good at. <laughs> so I now have written and uh, Talia's participating here as well. So I hope he can accept or I uh, hope this is the right point of contact. So if you do that, or if you prefer, just get in direct touch with me, it's fine as well. Uh, and we'll set up a meeting as soon as possible and, uh, and discuss, uh, discuss more. There are lots of questions piling in at the minute, Sven. Needless to say, I think there's quite a lot of interest to trial this equipment in Ireland. So you'll definitely find some candidate farms out there should you wish to, should you wish to enter the, <clears throat> the Irish market. But I think what we're going to do now, because we're trying to keep things on, on, on target, is if you stop sharing your screen, yeah. we will we move on to our next speaker. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you very much, Sven. We will move on to our next speaker, who is Luis Andres Sepulveda. And he is from PSP Solutions in Chile. And he is going to discuss a tried and tested bubble curtain for jellyfish and microalgal bloom prevention. So welcome, Lewis. Thank you, Jeffrey. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, my name is Luis Sepulveda and I represent Low O2 Water Aeration Solution. Uh, we are a Chilean company. And I'm going to present a tried and tested bubble curtain for jellyfish and the algae blooms that we have uh, uh, developed in Chile. Uh, you know, just after the, the big algae bloom that affected the salmon industry in Chile in 2016, uh, our company was born. After that, uh, we took an existing idea and uh, as a basis, and we, we develop and improve uh, this, this idea by implementing a specialized engineering to develop an effective and uh, an efficient bubble, bubble barrier uh, to fight against algae blooms and, and jellyfish. Uh, about us, what can I say? We are an engineering company. Uh, we are part of PSP Solutions Group, and we have specialized in sustainable water aeration solutions, mainly through air bubble barriers or air bubble curtains and upwelling systems. 100% environmentally friendly and with over 15 years of experience, the last five years, uh, specialized exclusively in air bubble barriers and upwelling systems. We have developed over 150 projects in Chile and other countries, and we have worked with the most important salmon producers in Chile. Our, our 150 projects are located in the south of Chile, basically in the 10th, in the 11th, and in the 12th region, where are mostly the, the salmon farms located in Chile. In the, in the past years, uh, we have seen uh, some events that have occurred uh, uh, regarding to algae blooms and jellyfish swarms. 
in different countries. Uh, as I said before, uh, the big loss in Chile of 2016 was the beginning of our company and where it started all. It started uh, developing and improving our technology until today that we have developed a uh, a very good standard, very good quality air bubble barrier that we have implemented in this 150 projects in, in our country. Not only uh, algae blooms and uh, jelly jellyfish swarms in, in Chile and, and in the UK, also in Norway, Australia and other countries have been affected with these events. And, and of course we expect that uh, because of the global warming, these kinds of events are going to be uh, improving uh, every time uh, more. So, I'm going to talk about our uh, development of our air bubble barriers or air bubble curtains. Basically, uh, we need to know how this, this works. It is the injection of compressed air to generate a micro bubble barrier. This is very important uh, to, to block microalgae and uh, jellyfish. We need to produce a micro bubble. We don't work with macro bubbles, uh, regular bubbles or nano bubbles. We have tried a lot and micro bubbles are the most, most efficient for this, which allows blocking undesirable elements in the sea or any other water body. What are the main uses that we have for this technology? Well, as I said before, algae blooms, jellyfish swarms, oil spill, litter and other polluting elements, and also underwater noise. What are the benefits of this apart from, from, from blocking these undesirable elements? Well, it protects environment and different ecosystems. And it is a technology that it is 100% environmentally friendly. I'm gonna talk about the, the key factors to generate an effective and an efficient bubble barrier uh, you need to consider uh, for implementing this kind of technology. Uh, as I said before, we, we took the idea, an existing idea, uh, as a basis, but we have worked very hard in developing and improving this technology in the last five years. So you need to have a specialized engineering uh, uh, to, to design this, this kind of solutions. You need to create a laminar flow barrier, not turbulent, and of course, not producing coalescence. The bubbles must not exceed 0 0.6 millimeters at the point of formation. You don't have to generate spaces between the lines of the racing bubbles. Of course, if you, if you have any spaces in between, that is a possibility that algae blooms or jellyfish to come into the to the to the area you are protecting you need a quality air compressor not any compressor uh, is useful for this technology we have designed a low pressure system this is associated to to have low operational costs we only work with high tech and quality materials and of course, based on a low pressure system. So we use low pressure materials and we don't, we don't need to use high pressure materials that of course are more expensive. And, and, and this is very important. This system is pneumatically self-balancing. So this, this is a system that you pressurize it and that's all, uh, you turn it on uh, and in 30 seconds, uh, in Chile, in 30 seconds, we have an average around, I don't know, three kilometers 
of pipelines and diffusers, and you take around 30 seconds to the to the curtain to start working in the whole salmon site. And if you turn it off and you turn it on, I don't know, weeks later, months later, this system is pneumatical self-balancing, so you don't need to do anything else. These are some important information of our system. The airflow that we generate, it uh, goes from 1.5 to 3 cubic meters per hour. Uh, and it has a work pressure that it is permanent that goes, this depends on the project, from 3 to 4.5 bar. This uh, we have our, uh, this is in a 20 meter depth work pressure average. And this is considering in one linear, linear meter installed diffuser. Here you can see some of our projects that have been installed in the salmon industry. As you can see, we have a, a different, different pens, different configurations of salmon sites. And one thing that it is very important, please see the white line that you see on the water surface that are the, the air bubbles that are exploding on the surface. If you see all this white line uh, uh, along the salmon side, it is a sign that the system is working fine. If you have spaces in between, that, that means that the, the system is not working fine and you probably will have to do some, some maintenance to the system. But this is how it should look uh, uh, a system that is working good. Our results in the, in the industry, well, first of all, we have installed more than 400 linear kilometers of pipelines and diffuser lines in Chile and other countries. We have measured, this is information of our customers, a 91% of effectiveness against algae bloom and 100% of effectiveness against jellyfish. Our added, our added value is based on two, two main points. The first of all, and as I said before, engineering, that it is based on design and development of customized solutions for every problem. Every problem we, we, we figure out how to solve it in an individual way. We have a permanent research, development and innovation. We're always improving. We have a high efficiency system because we work with a low pressure. We have designed known and basic systems systems that are reusable in other projects. It has a simple operation design and a low maintenance design. Uh, this is very important to keep operational costs down. And the other key point, of course, is a service, the service we provide, that it is based on our professionalism and responsibility a quick install and uninstall of all of our systems. We, we, we take uh, an average of three to four days to, to install one of these systems, uh, just to uh, have an idea. And we offer, of course, after sales service support 24 seven, and we have a critical spare part supply, uh, of course, available all, all the time. Thank you very much. Uh, I leave you there with my contact information. We have a web page that it is uh, www.low02.cl and that is our uh, email contact uh, where you can contact us if you have any doubts or you have any requirements. Well, thank you very much.
with you, Lewis. I'm not sure what time it is in Chile right now. Is it uh, still early in the morning? No, we just have three hours. Three hours of difference. Uh, it's uh, quarter, quarter to 12. Okay, a few questions coming in now that we'll get straight on to because we've only really one minute. So two, two questions kind of tying together. Will the technology work in shallow waters or is there a maximum depth and, and how do strong currents affect it? Is there a maximum current whereby the bubble barrier will be less effective? Is that something you've done any work on? That are, that are some, some key data that we need to collect uh, to develop the, 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 the proper solution for, for that kind of, of problem you want to you wanna solve. Uh, we need depth. In Chile, we work from 20 to 30 meters depth. Of course, we, we can develop uh, solutions in shallow waters. That's not a problem at all. We can develop solutions installing our diffusers in the in the sea bottom. That is not uh, a problem for us. We are in a in a process of of patenting our technology today, because we have designed an exclusive design that goes in the sea bottom, you know, and keeps the same the same pressure of the whole air bu air bubble barrier automatically. So you don't have you don't need bulbs and start moving bulbs everywhere to keep the same pressure in the whole system. So, because that's that's a key part of our design. We, we have been working in the salmon industry for many years ago. We understand that salmon sites in Chile are located in very, very uh, far locations. So they need to, to uh, have the possibility of, they, of, of working with a system that it is uh, simple, that it is reliable, and they can trust. Yeah, thank you, Lewis. We actually have a few more questions coming in, and I know everyone would like answers to the questions, but we're really trying to keep it on target. So what I'm going to suggest is we might be in communication after the meeting. You may answer the questions, and then we can put those up on the IATIP website, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Just just so that we can continue moving on because there might be people just dialing into certain presentations. So we want to try and keep it roughly on target. So thanks again, Lewis. No, uh, so thank, now, you. thank you all. Yes, thanks. So now, Brian Quinn from the University of West Scotland and his title, Rapid Diagnostics to Assess Fish Health for the Aquaculture Sector. Welcome, Brian. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? I cannot see your screen at the moment. Oh, I'm, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Sorry. It looked like your screen was sharing, but then it very quickly disappeared. My internet is, we had the internet person out this morning. Um, can you still see me? I can see you and I can see your the first page of your presentation. Okay, well, I'm not touching anything else then because I'm getting a, a, my other screen is showing me something I shouldn't see. Okay, thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you very much to BIM for, for, for funding the event today. And of course, to ITIP for putting it all together, the Secretariat, and for the invitation to join you. Um, my name is Brian Quinn. I'm a professor of ecotoxicology in the University of the West of Scotland. You might have gathered I'm not a native Scot. I'm from Dundalk, but I've been over here for eight years now, and I'm going to talk to you about work that research that we're undertaking, which is looking at rapid or developing rapid diagnostics to assess fish health for the aquaculture sector. Now, obviously, mortality is an issue in aquaculture. It is in, uh, in any farming uh, scenario, uh, but uh, we all know that Chile is the largest producer of, of salmon globally. With 90% mortality uh, is costing them around 1.2 billion pounds a year. So that's quite a significant impact. Uh, in 2016, they spent over 390 million pounds on fish health. Uh, and that grew five year, 5% five from the previous year. And of course is growing as things are getting more complicated with water temperatures and uh, things like that, as we just heard from Lewis's talk. Scotland where I'm based, 
20% mortality equates pretty much to nearly 38,000 tonnes with a market value of 148 million. So it's worth investigating ways to try and reduce this mortality. So the current healthcare model for aquaculture is, in some ways, it's based around that. And this isn't necessarily identification of disease. This is health assessment. Health assessment is based on observing that there's a problem, observing that the fish aren't well. A vet is called out. Histology sections are taken from three to five fish, which is not a very representative sample number. Those samples are sent to the laboratory, they're processed, and a report is generated. Feedback that I've got from the fish farmers is that this can take up to 10 days. Now it can be quicker, but it can take up to 10 days. And the report, there isn't any quantitative, necessary quantitative data that they can act upon. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a more proactive healthcare model. And this is based on the continuous monitoring, health monitoring of the fish, because we're using blood-based non-lethal methods. That way we can use higher numbers. 30 fish is generally what we, we, we ask the, the producers to send us. That fish is sent to us in our laboratory. We work our magic on it. Data is generated and that data then is going to be uh, analyzed and presented via a mobile app to the fish health farmer within 24 hours of us receiving the sample. There's also a web portal where they can log in and look at all the different sites and compare, and again, different territories if it's a multinational company. So obviously this is all about generating data, processing the data, and then distributing the data to, to the customer. We're hoping that obviously it's known that if you can identify a health challenge earlier on, the treatment efficacy is much, much higher. And uh, of course, then there's greater uh, potential to decrease mortalities. So if you're waiting for a symptoms-based approach, then you're, you know, your FC isn't as good and obviously your, your treatment won't be as effective. So there's a predictive element to this as well, being able to predict what's going to happen to the organism by looking at what the, bio, the, the, the biology is telling us. At the moment, we're concentrating on salmon and trout because we're based in Scotland. However, we've also looked at sea bass and sea bream and it can even use this on shellfish. I uh, spoke this morning about the potential on, on shellfish bivalves uh, for, for this approach. So why clinical chemistry? Well, clinical chemistry is the cornerstone of human and veterinary medicine. It's what we do if we're not well, we go to the doctor, he takes a blood sample, sends it to the lab and it gets analysed through by clinical chemistry. It's rapid, cost-effective, non-lethal, which is a big advantage, and practical tools. So we can analyze large numbers of individuals in a rapid time. Again, we can use it to investigate health at a population level, not just three fish in a pen of 40,000. We can take several to 10 or 20 fish per pen and look at it at more of a population level. We can evaluate the fish physiology and metabolic responses, which are difficult to do by using histopathology. Obvious question is why hasn't this been done before? And I've been asked that. And the reason, the answer is because it's not easy. We've been doing it for mammals for a long time. We know what the background levels are for the biomarkers. And we also know what the clinical significance is then with a health challenge. We're developing that in, in my lab. We're work, that's what we've been working on for the last four years. We've established these background levels and we're investigating the clinical significance. So, this morning I talked about using these small point of care analyzers, which have their limitations, can be useful, but have their limitations. And the other scale of that is in hospitals, they have these massive laboratories, walk-in labs where there's just huge numbers of systems that are hooked up together. We're in between, we're an automated system, but relatively high throughput, 400 tests an hour. But what are we looking at? Well, these are the endpoints that we're investigating. Again, as you'd expect, liver function, kidney function, pancreas function, muscle, heart. Also, some of them can be used for gills. So for example, the, the, the electrolytes, electrolyte imbalance, smolification as well, minerals. So it's the general homeostasis, as well as being able to focus on individual tissues and organs of, of the fish. Okay, so evidence of clinical significance. Now, obviously I have plenty of examples. We've been doing this for a while. I didn't want to bamboozle you with graphs and information. So this is just one example from a, a farm that contacted us and said, we've got an outbreak of diagnosed complex gill disease, CGD. Do you want samples? 
fantastic. They took 30 control samples and 30 of the diagnosed fish or fish from the uh, diagnosed pen. And you can see that quite a few of the biomarkers, 11 out of the 18 biomarkers that we investigated, showed a highly significant difference. So the more evidence that we're generating, the more. And you can see here that the error bars are quite low, so we're getting good reproducibility. So this is where I am, the Aquaculture Health Laboratory, uh, based in the University of the West of Scotland. I have a shiny new lab. Uh, I've got some pretty nifty kit, which is great, uh, funded by the EMFF uh, fund, which now isn't called the EMFF, it's now just the MFF because we're out of the EU. Uh, so, and I've got a great team of people. I've got five postdocs working on this. As I mentioned, the whole idea is blood tests for fish. This approach has been very much embraced by the industry. I'm an academic, but I've, I've also run a company, a business, I have a business background. And I'm not, I'm interested in two things. One, yes, answering scientific questions, but two, providing a service because this isn't available and this is something that the industry are actively looking for. So I've engaged with the industry. They've embraced the idea and supported it. Every salmon producer in Scotland is involved in this work and is sending me samples. And one of the two trout farmers, trout producers. I've got over 1.6 million pounds in research funding and I'm commercializing this through Scottish Enterprise Programme to spin out a company in September next year uh, in order to offer this as a commercial service to the industry. Okay. So that's pretty much a, 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 a nutshell of, of what, what we're doing. Conclusion is fish health assessment using clinical chemistry. Everyone's interested in costs. How much is this going to cost me? So I have a advisory, an industry advisory board, and that consists of members from the four, from the five biggest producers in Scotland. And they, I get feedback from them on the techniques that we're using, the endpoints that they want us to investigate, and I've run past them ideas of pricing as well. So what they've said that in, in Scotland, the aquaculture industry, my advisory board, wanted to use clinical chemistry as an additional tool for fish health monitoring. They're looking for two types of analysis. One, monthly site analysis, sampling of general metabolic panel, general well-being of the fish. For example, 20 biomarkers. I've calculated, obviously it'll be dependent on the numbers and the, the type of biomarkers, but as a ballpark, I've, give, I've priced that as around 38 pounds a sample or 190 per, and this, these are pounds uh, per sample. Sorry, 190 per biomarker. So one sample, you get 20 biomarkers, that's 20 results uh, for, for 38 pounds. So that's the monthly analysis, health analysis. They're also used, interested in using it as a diagnostic tool to help identify specific health challenges. And again, that can potentially lead to then early diagnosis. And again, aid husbandry decisions. Knowing when not to treat sea lice can sometimes be as important as knowing when to treat sea lice or what method to use, because obviously you can get mortality events coming from improper treatment. Again, our biomarker for our diagnostic panels, eight biomarkers, comes out around 28, sorry, 23 pounds or 288 per, per biomarker. Industry are looking for rapid, non-lethal, cost-effective analysis with the ability to sample larger numbers within the population. So that's what we're, we're aiming for. We're working together in a collaborative approach. It's not very often, these are all competitors. It's not very often that they get together and, and see the advantage of working cohesively to try and develop a technology that they can all benefit from at the end. But that's what we've got. We've got a more productive collaborative approach, which is more productive than them working each individually towards this. And of course, my question for the audience today, would this facility be of interest to the Irish aquaculture industry? Because this is very much something that I'd love to roll out in Ireland and to get involved in the aquaculture industry. Obviously you're lower volume, but your cost per fish is more. So it might actually be something that, that you could benefit from. There's my contact details, my email, uh, which obviously I'd be delighted for, 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 for the ITIP and BIM to share. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. That was, that was very interesting and very impressive that you managed to bring together a a group of competitors to work collaboratively because that can sometimes be a challenge.
Yeah. So it's great, and it, it probably speaks volumes about what's happening when everyone is uh, when everyone, everyone is supporting that venture. I think we are, we're already short for time. I don't know whether people want to say whether they are interested in this through the Q and A. Um, they can just stick. To, you know, there are various representatives from the farmers here, so they can certainly put that down there. I think you've answered the first question in terms of the costs associated. So you've given us kind of the costs of the various panels or blood markers that you will be looking at. Um, so I think we've answered that question. Uh, in any event, I would like to come back to you with, um, with, with some things that would be of interest to me um, in respect of the Irish salmon farming industry. So we might have a conversation after I've consulted with the industry over here, if that's okay with you, Brian. Great, I'm uh, super. I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to offer this, as I say. At the, oh, I should add as well, at the moment, I'm doing this free of charge because this is all research projects at the moment. So I can, if, if producers want to send blood to the laboratory, I can analyze it free of charge and provide them with the data, the information. Uh, it's not until September that we're going to start charging as a commercial entity. Until then, I've got research funding, research projects that all the samples are being analysed under. So it's, at the moment, it's free. So, Okay, excellent. We've actually one more question about regulation. But we, I think if we have time at 3.20, we might come back and address a few of those questions. So hopefully you'll still be around. Yeah, certainly will. So we are, we are going to move on. And we have Alex Gardner from Sanju. And he has been looking at an effective eco-friendly biological treatment for ichthyotherus multifilis. And he will be joined by Jorgen Hansen. I believe both of them are going to present. So if you would like... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll present. Um, uh, Jorgen Yor is here to uh, add scientific backup should anyone, uh, or should I need it uh, when the questions come uh, at the end. Um, so I should say first, I'm, I'm actually Andy, not Alex. I'm, Alex must be my unsuspected uh, evil twin. So if anything goes wrong at this point, I'm going to blame him. Um, but I thank uh, uh, IATIP and uh, BIM for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about Sundew, um, our company, uh, where we are, how we got there, and, and particularly the first product that we're developing. Can I just check because it's not clear on my screen that you're seeing you're seeing the, uh, the presentation? Okay, ah, that I think that may be better. Yeah, that's that's excellent there. I think so. Uh, an, an overview of the company and um, so summed you in one slide, and and our big picture, I guess, is that there is a a big demand globally for new approaches to pests and diseases that are carried in water. And right now for us, that means aquaculture as it, it, it does, I guess, for everyone here. Um, but in the longer term, we're also thinking about uh, the pests that are carried, say, in uh, groundwater and are problems for crop and animal agriculture or for uh, ecological problems like, like the red tide in, in the picture here. And even potentially for, for human health uh, with disease vectors such as cholera are, are, are carried in, in water. And looking at all those sorts of problems, you see that um, good solutions will have certain characteristics in common. Um, they need to be spread over a wide area, so they need to be cheap. They need to be good at targeting um, the, the actual pest. They need to be environmentally benign. And it's our view that uh, biology and life sciences will provide approaches that have the, the, the right sort of uh, characteristics to be useful uh, in that area. That's the big picture. Right now, what we have is a first product in development, uh, and that is a, a, a product targeted at ick, uh, white spot disease in freshwater finfish. It's based on an invention that came out of a large uh, EU program that many people may be familiar with called Parafish Control, and was specifically invented uh, at the Institute of Ecology in Fageningen in the Netherlands and at the University of Copenhagen. Um, we have a, a worldwide exclusive license to develop that into product. Uh, in the last year we've raised roughly two and a half million euros in funding uh, from a variety of sources but mainly as grants and uh, convertible loans and that enabled us really to start building uh, the company. The company is very much a startup, it was formed in Copenhagen 
uh, just about two years ago, but it's only in the last year that we, we've really got moving. And that money has enabled us to build on what we hope is a, a strong founding team, um, which has a great deal of experience in developing products such as ours, uh, using fermentation and taking them to market, and also in developing small companies. And to them, we, we've now added uh, four scientists with, with, with more to come. To take a look at the, the product, it, it's a microbial extract that, that comes from a bacterium. Um, and what we see in the lab, and, and I should emphasize that right now we are, we are still in the lab, nothing, nothing has been done outside. Um, we're expecting to start field or pond trials uh, in the early part of next year. Um, we, we have a partnership with the uh, Danish Trout Producers Association where we're gonna start doing that, but we'd be interested in talking to anyone else who was interested in helping uh, us to, to test the, the product. And the product, uh, as I say, if, if what we see in the lab is that on a time scale of, sort of 10 minutes to an hour, 100% killing of the, uh, the parasite that causes it um, depends somewhat on the, uh, on the concentration, but this, this is sort of unoptimized. This is data from the, the patent uh, and we see very effective killing. We also see no apparent deleterious effects on the fish. We have some more testing to do on that, but, but right now we, we know of nothing. And it's, it's a product that breaks down on a time scale of a few hours to a day or so uh, into sort of harmless byproducts that, that are going to sort of just wash away into, into the environment. So we see it as being very attractive um, compared with current approaches. Um, people will be familiar uh, in aquaculture with formaldehyde and the difficulties of using that. Um, it's certainly used very widely within, among our partners in, in Denmark, but um, in fact, theoretically in Denmark, the, the product is banned for aquaculture use, but because they can't find uh, an alternative solution, then they have a special exemption to continue using it. Um, we're also interested actually in selling this product into the market for ornamental fish where the, the products that are used to control this parasite are even more harmful. So malachite green is a, is a known carcinogen for instance. So, so what we see is something that is much uh, gentler in, in use. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that and, and the reason we think that we may need sort of lower or less frequent dosing is that whereas the chemical approaches only kill the theron, so one of the three swimming stages uh, of the parasite, we see uh, an effect on, on all of the life cycle stages that are outside the fish, which includes the cysts in the bottom of the pond, which are regarded as being very important um, and, and a big limitation on current approaches. So we have two, I think, big challenges over the next three or four years. Um, the first is scaling up production. As I say, we're in the lab at the moment and our production capacity in the lab, I, I think right now is about 10 grams a week. Um, if we're gonna get anywhere near the, the market potential that we think we have for this, we have to be producing on a ton scale. So there's a big scale up uh, job to be done. Fortunately, we have a team that has a great deal of experience in doing that. Uh, and, and we're quite confident that we can get there at a, at a cost of goods that will mean at least in use, uh, the cost of using our product will be um, at least this, roughly the same, shall we say, uh, as, as using existing chemical products. Our other big uh, job over the next few years is regulation. Uh, exactly how long that will take um, depends rather on how we choose to regulate it. Um, but we've been around this a few years as well. Um, we, um, you know, we, we, we're not naive about how long it will take. And I think our, our most wildly optimistic estimates suggest that we're going to have product for sale in aquaculture in sort of four or five years and, and know that it could easily take uh, a little bit longer than, than this. And in ornamental fish, we, we, we see lower regulatory barriers and we hope that Certainly within a year, we may be able to make sales in, into that market. Uh, this is our team. Um, the founders, as I say, have a lot of experience uh, with these sorts of products. You can see that uh, Jürgen and uh, others from the, the, the founding team were involved in a Swiss company called Evolver, 
uh, which has been one of the um, sort of success stories, I think, of European biotech over the last 10 or 15 years. And Evolver's business has been in producing speciality molecules uh, using yeast as a system. Um, we, we use bacteria, but of course, a lot of similarities in production and the fermentation processes that are needed there. And on the right hand side, the four scientists that we've hired so far this year, we're expecting to add another one before the end of the year, uh, possibly some more early next year, along with a full time CEO who, who is lined up and, and ready to start. So the uh, um, summary, I guess, you know, our big picture is is all manner of waterborne pests and diseases right now focused on it. We have some money, certainly next year, we'll be out looking for more, probably for equity. Uh, we're also very interested in finding more grant funding and be very interested to hear from anyone in the audience, either from academia uh, or from the industry who has any interest in, in partnerships for, for looking for grant funding. Um, that's my contact details. I think that's all I have to say to you right now. I'll be very glad to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andy, and my apologies. I have no excuse for not knowing your name because it's written on your screen. So, <laughs> so, so please accept my apologies. No uh, that was that was very interesting and nice to to know that you guys are making your way towards market. We want one question in here from Pete McGovern. So he says you've you've stated that it appears non toxic to fish. So where does that leave testing? regulation and licensing and maybe I could add that you had on one of your slides that you have a team of people who are familiar with going through that that process and I wondered just in respect of some of our processes in Ireland for the likes of salmon smokes on sites affected by ick would you consider running in parallel a process that could permit this to be used in an organic manner so we need to make sure that everything we're using complies with the organic regulations. So is that something that you're considering? I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer that question. I mean, personally, I'm not entirely certain what, what how we would impact or how the organic regulations would impact us. Um, I have no experience of that. I don't know if you're, you know. I mean, it would be about, I mean, I have been uh, acquainted with this before in fermentation, so it would be, uh, about sourcing the 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 the, the sort of um, the substances that our bacteria lives off uh, from uh, organic sources uh, that is doable so that's certainly doable in fermentation we have not discussed it a lot um, but it's something we could do would there be a market for it yeah i guess from my perspective i see the the organic salmon market in particular growing. I expect the organic trout market will also grow. So it would really be a case of deciding whether you future-proof your company in that way, or, you know, there's still plenty of conventional production out there, I expect, and and that's probably okay too. Right. I mean, it, I mean, I, I can, uh, without going into details, I can say that it's a, it's a rather simple fermentation process uh, with not so many uh, substances needed, uh, nothing exotic. So it would it would be relatively straightforward to, to get there, and the, um, the 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 extract in itself, or the product in itself, is um, it's not GMO. It's a natural extract. So uh, I, I think all the prerequisites are there for doing that. So that's that's very nice input. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Andy. I might just come back to one of your statements that says it appears non toxic. So in respect of that statement. What number of trials or how many times have you had fish? Have you been trying to check out what the lethal doses might be or have you not got that far yet? No, we, we haven't got that far. Um, we, we've done some behavioural studies on the fish and not seen any problems there. Um, certainly sort of proper toxicity testing is still something to do. And I think something we have scheduled for, for next year. Um, as I say, you know, it, it, it's only, oh, and I say we raised the money this year most of that has come in since August. So, so we're still sort of ramping up uh, as quickly as we can to, to, to get on with that testing, but no, much of that is still to be done. I could say that in, in the, the studies we have done uh, shows that um, uh, there's been two studies done, independent studies done on, on behavioral um, studies, and at 10 times the, um, the therapeutic dose, uh, we see no effects, no, no deleterious effects. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's very informative. I wonder now, could we ask all the presenters at this session to turn on their cameras? Because we have a few minutes. We're, we're planning to finish about half three. There are a few questions outstanding. So what I might do now is I might go back to those and pose those questions and, uh, and see how we get on prior to finishing up at 3.30. Does that sound okay to everyone? So. Okay, so I think first of all, I am going to go to Lewis. I'm not sure if he is there. From Lou 2 PSB. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure. Were you looking at the questions uh, as they came in? There no, are, I, can, I, I, I couldn't look the questions. Okay, there's a couple of questions for you, Lewis, and I'm not sure whether you have access to this information now or whether you have general information. So there were a few people asking about the, the general cost, the current cost associated with the deployment in terms of the kilowatts, say per meter or the kilowatts per kilometer of, let's say, of, of system provided. I know how deep is it, how far away is it from the, from the compressor? Those are all questions that we need answered. But do you have a rule of thumb for people just to give them a rough idea what kind of cost they would be looking at? Uh, well, as, 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 as I told you before, uh, we analyzed every project as a single one, as a different one. So I, 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 I just have to say that our technology have affordable prices. Yeah, we are very interested in doing business in Ireland. So, so we, can, we can check and we can see the possibility of uh, having some more information to to give a, a, a formal proposal uh, and understanding that it's not only the length uh, it is the the depth it is uh, the quality of the of the air of the air compressor you need to work with and the the quality air barrier you want to what, what do you want to block uh, you just want to block jellyfish you want to block algae bloom and jellyfish that also depends on the cost of the of the of the of the system okay okay so uh, i i suspect it will be up to individuals who are interested in that cost yeah but it's absolutely to... affordable affordable prices okay and there was another question for you and that came from someone and they were wondering had you ever considered becoming involved or are you already involved in the production of aeration systems for moving bed bioreactors? Uh, or is that something you're familiar with in terms of recirculating technology? No, 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 no. Yet, yet we're not familiar with, with that. We're just, uh, our, our main focus today is air bubble barriers and upwelling systems. That is our main focus today. We, we are, uh, you know, Low O2 is, an, is a new company that it depends on PSP solutions. And the, the reason that this company was born was to reach other markets, such as the Irish one, and not only aquaculture uh, markets, also other industries that have different problems uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I don't know, jellyfish swarms, for example, in desalination plants. That, that have these problems in the adductions of water, for example. And we are searching for other possibilities, but that is our focus today. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm sure we had a few other questions that I am currently, I'm currently looking through to see if I can find them. So I'm gonna go back into the Q and A's that may have been answered. and see what questions we have here. Sorry, excuse me for a moment. If you would like to chat amongst yourself, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, okay, I think, I think we've, I think actually we've answered those outstanding questions. I had a feeling there was one other one, but okay, maybe I just combined some questions uh, and those ones are answered. So if there are no, I can't see any other questions coming in. 
So if we're, we're all finished, and I, I think maybe Georgia will close, but I would like to say that I find that very interesting and I would really like to thank our, our speakers for coming this afternoon. I know the Friday afternoon is never the easy one, particularly after lunch, but I think you did a, a brilliant job of sharing the information and the knowledge that you guys have with us. And I think the people listening across Ireland at the moment would probably, would probably be giving everyone a small clap at the moment, because I think it really was worthwhile attending this. And so thank you very much for that. Georgia, will I pass over to you? Yeah, great. So obviously, thank you very much to everybody for attending today. Thank you very much for the speakers and for the chairs for your time and efforts in preparing for this meeting. Um, just to let you know that everything will be, everything's been recorded and I'll put it online this afternoon and it will be available on the news pages on www.iatip.ie. Um, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, please send them to secretariat at iatip.ie and we'll pass it on to the speakers. But thank you very much, successful event and great to see all of you.